Okay, let's start. Come on. Huh? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Okay, welcome everyone to this week's edition of the ENLA seminar. So I'm very happy to welcome Cameron Musco as today's speaker. Cameron did his PhD at MIT with Nancy Lynch and is now an assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, Cameron is, is very well known for randomized techniques, especially in the context of dimensionality reduction and matrix approximation. In fact, one of his papers was discussed uh, during the talk of Joel Trop on this um, recursive uh, low rank approximation where you where you uh, compute the uh, the uh, distribution used for sampling columns or rows of a matrix for low rank approximation and personally i'm very happy that uh, today's talk is about hutch plus uh, plus this is really exciting work uh, which i have looked into and it's one of these things where the where you see think afterwards, wow, this is such a natural idea. Uh, why didn't I think about it? And uh, they thought about it and we have a very nice analysis. So please go ahead, uh, Cameron. Uh, great, thanks Daniel for the introduction. Um, and thanks for inviting me and thanks for everybody for attending. And yeah, I agree with Daniel. This talk is about this algorithm that we're looking at um, called Hutch++, which is uh, sort of gives us optimal rates for matrix retrace estimation and one advantage is it's super simple. Um, and hopefully, so I'll be able to kind of discuss it in full today. So this is joint work with Raphael Meyer and Christopher Musco at NYU and David Woodruff at Carnegie Mellon. So um, the problem we're talking about today is um, implicit trace estimation or matrix-free trace estimation. Um, we're given access to an N by N matrix A. Um, only through matrix vector multiplication. So we're not able to read entries. We can just compute A times X for a vector X. And what our goal is to do is approximate the trace of that matrix. We want to approximate the sum of its diagonal entries. And the big question in implicit trace estimation is what's the computational cost, which in this case boils down to how many matrix vector multiplication queries, how many uh, vectors of the form AX1, AX2, up to AXM, are required to get a good approximation to the trace of the matrix. Um, so algorithms in this general model where you're not able to read entry of the, of the matrix, but you're only able to access through matrix vector multiplication queries are often known in the community as matrix free methods or implicit matrix methods. And they're useful in a lot of contexts. One reason they're useful is because matrix vector multiplication is extremely efficient. So it's a great way to access your matrix. But beyond that, they're very useful when a is not given explicitly, but we do have an efficient algorithm for multiplying A by a vector. Um, and this appears in a lot of contexts. So I'll just give two examples. One would be when A is the Hessian or the Jacobian of uh, some function. Um, so for some vector X, we're able to compute the product of the Jacobian with that vector in many cases, or the product of the Hessian with that vector in many cases using either finite difference methods or explicit differentiation. Um, even though it would be very expensive to fully compute that Jacobian or Hessian out or write it down explicitly. So we can much more quickly compute matrix vector products with A, which in this case is either the Jacobian or the Hessian, than we could actually write down that full matrix. So that's one example of when you want to employ a matrix-free method. Another example is when A, our matrix of interest, is a function of another may be explicitly given matrix B. So A is equal to F of B. Um, a simple example would be A is equal to B cubed. Uh, computing the trace of the adjacency matrix cubed of a graph corresponds to, for example, counting triangles in a graph. So this is one case when this comes up. If I wanna write down A um, in order to be able to access its entries, it's gonna require me N cubed operations to compute B times B times B. Um, but if I just wanna compute a matrix vector product with A, if A is equal to B cubed, I just need to compute three successive matrix vector products with B. So it takes three times N squared operations. And so A times X is much, much more quickly to compute than actually writing down A explicitly. Okay. A cubed is a really simple function, but for more complex matrix functions, as, as most people here well know, we can often approximate them efficiently using iterative methods. So a classic example would be when A is the inverse of a given matrix B. 
we can compute this iteratively. We can compute matrix vector products with this inverse using conjugate gradient or minres or any linear system solver, any iterative system solver. Um, or if A is some function of the eigenvalues uh, of B. So A is the matrix exponential of B or the matrix square root or the matrix logarithm. These types of matrix functions can be approximated using polynomial and rational approximation um, using, for example, the Lanchos method. We can very efficiently multiply these matrix functions by a vector. So typically, um, the runtime of these methods, I'm not going to get into them in detail, but they basically require C matrix vector multiplications with B itself. So you can think about them as running in N squared times C time, where C is your number of iterations. Typically, C is going to be a lot less than N. And so this is going to be a lot cheaper than computing out these functions explicitly in any cube time. So these are just some examples of cases when I can much more efficiently compute matrix vector products with the matrix than I could compute the matrix out explicitly. So what we're looking at today is uh, matrix free trace estimation. So when I care about approximating the trace of these different functions of a given matrix, or in general, approximating the trace of a matrix um, that isn't given to me explicitly. There's tons of applications of this. It's been really widely studied in the literature. I'll just give like a very brief list here, um, but a great survey to look at is there, there's a recent very short sort of list of applications by Ubaru and Saad in 2017. So I mentioned this one already. If I want to count the number of triangles in a graph, if B is the adjacency matrix of that graph, the number of triangles is times six is equal to the trace of B cubed. And trace estimation techniques are often used in triangle counting algorithms. Um, in Bayesian optimization and experimental design, um, the log likelihood of a linear model with uh, basically a Gaussian prior and Gaussian noise often involve or does involve this term, which is the log determinant of the covariance matrix B. The log determinant is nothing more than the trace of the logarithm of the matrix B. So that's another widely used application of trace estimation. The Estrada index, which is a measure of protein folding degree, or more recently, uh, generally network connectivity is the trace of the exponential of a matrix. Um, and in general, information about the matrix eigenvalue spectrum can often be obtained by looking at trace of different functions of B. Um, because the trace of the matrix is the sum of its eigenvalues. So as I apply different eigenvalue transformations to B, I sort of probe the spectrum of B and I can learn about this spectrum. Um, this has been used a lot recently for things like counting the number of eigenvalues in, in an interval, doing spectral density estimation or estimating density of states for eigenvalues, uh, approximating matrix norms. There's all sorts of applications where you're trying to probe and get some sense of what the spectrum looks like. And you basically do this by computing trace or approximating trace of various functions of a matrix. Um, all right, so those are just some example applications. So first, let me present a naive um, matrix free trace estimation algorithm that you never use, but just to get you a sense of what's going on here. Remember, I want to compute the sum of diagonal entries of a matrix A, but I only have access to efficient matrix vector multiplications with A. One thing I can do is I could just query A with every one of the standard basis vectors. So I could look at EI, the ith standard basis vector for I equals one to N, and I could compute A times E1, A times E2, all the way up to A times EN. This gives me access to every single column of A. And if I just sum up XI transpose AI, this is exactly the I at diagonal entry of A. And so this is exactly the trace. So what this tells us is that <clears throat> using N matrix vector multiplications, we can get an exact solution to this problem. We can exactly compute the trace. But what we're aiming to do is to have many, many less matrix vector multiplications, um, uh, approximate the trace with many less matrix vector multiplications. And we're going to do this basically by using randomization and allowing ourselves some approximation factor. Okay. So now let me mention or bring up sort of the algorithm that this whole paper is based on. And it's by far the most used method for matrix retrace estimation. It's called Hutchinson's method or Hutchinson's stochastic trace estimator, which was introduced by Hutchinson in 1991, but I think actually also independently introduced by Girard in 1987. Um, this is a really simple way of estimating the trace of the matrix. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick M vectors, uh, each 
which has independent plus minus one entries. So each vector has every entry set independently, half probability it's one, half probability it's negative one. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return as an estimation to my trace, the average of the quadratic forms of those random vectors over the matrix. So um, you're gonna average Xi transpose A Xi. And note that this requires exactly M matrix vector products. I have to compute A Xi and then doing the quadratic form is just a vector vector inner product, okay? Um, this is Hutchinson's method. It's not hard to show that T tilde is a, an unbiased estimator for the trace of A. It's also not hard to bound its variance and then to give approximation guarantees for this method. And I'll show you those guarantees in the next slide. I'll also note that there's lots of variance on this method. For example, you can let these random probe vectors have independent Gaussian entries. But in this talk, the distinction isn't important. There is work looking at the different merits of these different distributions of the random vectors, but I'm just not gonna go into it today. So just think about them for simplicity as being plus or minus one entries. And I would say, as far as I know, Hutchinson's method is the dominant way of estimating the trace of implicitly given matrices. So it's basically the most used matrix-free trace estimation algorithm. So what sort of approximation does Hutchinson's method give us? Um, there's been a lot of work on this. Um, I'm not gonna cite it all here, but th here's a sampling of different papers that sort of give bounds for the uh, accuracy of Hutchinson's. And actually, if you wanna get not super tight bounds, you can analyze it. You can just analyze the expectation and variance of the estimator very easily, and you'll get a bound that is roughly what I'm presenting you to here. So the bound is that if I let T tilde be the trace estimate returned by Hutchinson's method. If I take roughly one over epsilon squared queries, where epsilon is some error parameter I pick and where my little squiggle notation is just gonna hide constants. So I'm gonna ignore constants throughout the talk. If I take roughly one over epsilon squared um, matrix vector products, then with high probability, my estimate T tilde is gonna be within an epsilon times the Frobenius norm of A fat error of the trace. So absolute value of T tilde minus the trace will be epsilon times the Frobenius norm of A. Um, high probability I have in quotes because I'm also gonna sort of ignore um, the exact dependence on the probability. This has been worked out really carefully in these different works that I've cited, but just think about it today with 99% probability, um, this bound is gonna hold. Uh, now, if A is a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix, which is a setting that we're gonna focus on throughout this talk, then I can write the Frobenius norm in terms of the eigenvalues and therefore use it to bound the trace. So if A is symmetric positive semi-definite or in general, not if it, just in general, the Frobenius norm is, the Frobenius norm squared is the sum of squared eigenvalues. So the Frobenius norm is the square root of the sum of squared eigenvalues, which is only less than the sum of eigenvalues, um, which is the trace. So for a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix, the Frobenius norm is always um, less than the trace. So therefore this error bound, oh, I actually closed down my talk. This error bound is always less than or equal to epsilon times the trace. So one nice way of writing this error bound, it's a little bit looser, but just, just to view it as a relative error bound, T tilde with high probability is gonna be within one plus epsilon times your trace and one minus epsilon times your trace. And this is gonna be the guarantee we're targeting and proving today. We're gonna to look at, can we improve, get a better estimator with the same guarantee? Okay, so why don't I stop for a minute and see if there's any questions. So there are currently no uh, questions in the Zoom chat. Okay. I guess I just had one, which is when you say better estimate, is that just reducing M? Just Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll okay. formally state the next slide, but what we wanna do is we wanna give we want an estimator, we want an algorithm that gives the same worst case guarantees. So for any A, I get this one plus or minus epsilon approximation to the trace with high probability. And we mm -hmm. wanna do that with a smaller M. Yeah, thanks. There's also no questions on uh, YouTube right now. Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, great. So that's Hutchinson's method and that's the guarantee for Hutchinson's method. Um, so roughly just like summarizing that result is that for any matrix A in the worst case, if I take one over epsilon squared matrix vector multiplications, um, 
one minus epsilon and one plus epsilon of the two true trace. And our research question is just, can this be improved? <clears throat> can we provably take less matrix vector multiplications? And in particular, we're gonna want the number of matrix vector multiplications to have a better dependence on epsilon. So as epsilon gets smaller, this number of matrix vector multiplications grows quadratically in epsilon. We want it to grow at a lower rate so we can get higher accuracy with less uh, uh, matrix vector multiplications. Okay. Um, a broader line of work that this research question fits into that we've been really interested in recently is obtaining tight upper and lower bounds on the complexity of basic linear algebraic problems like trace estimation in this matrix vector query model. So in the computational model where I'm only able to access my matrix via matrix vector multiplication. Um, there's been a lot of work on this in recent years. Um, there's been a lot of work on algorithms in this model for decades, but on lower bounds, meaning proving that you can't do better than uh, some number of queries or proving that the current algorithms are optimal, there's been a lot less work. Um, recently, uh, some work has shown that uh, methods like the Lantros method are optimal for computing the top eigenvector. Um, in this model, there's, there's been work showing optimality of solving least squares regression problems. So basically uh, approximating linear system solves in this model. Um, and then there's been work showing lower bounds for how well you can do on doing things like testing the rank of a matrix, testing if a matrix is symmetric and all sorts of other testing problems, assuming access to that matrix via um, matrix vector multiplication queries. Um, and the reason we care so much about this model is that the matrix vector query model generalizes some of the most common models of computation in linear algebra. So in particular, two ones that I work a lot on and that this model generalizes are one, um, the Krilov subspace model. So in Krilov subspace methods, you're generally computing, uh, this, you're computing uh, basically, if you ignore like exactly how you compute it, you're computing something mathematically equivalent to computing a times x, a squared times x, all the way up to a to the m times x for some power x. So you're computing these vectors which span the m-dimensional Krylov subspace of a uh, applied to x. Um, and then you usually return an approximation to say the solution to a linear system or to an eigenvector, which lies in the span of that Krylov subspace. So you can think about that as it's some polynomial time in your matrix times your vector x. And in the Krylov subspace model, you can often show that things are optimal. Like for example, the conjugate gradient method for solving linear systems um, can be shown to be optimal in a sense by using lower bounds uh, based around approximation theoretic arguments or based around the fact that your output is a polynomial in A times your input. Um, in the general matrix vector query model, you can't do this because you're not just restricted to a Krilov subspace. So it becomes harder to prove um, lower bounds or optimality guarantees on algorithms. Um, the matrix sketching model is also a special case of the matrix vector query model. So this relates to a lot of uh, what Martinson uh, was talking about last week or two weeks ago, I guess. Um, in the matrix sketching model, we compute uh, a bunch of matrix vector products with our matrix AX1 up to AXM, where our query vectors are, are chosen non-adaptively and usually they're chosen randomly. So usually these vectors are like independent random Gaussian vectors. Um, there's been lots of work in the randomized numerical linear algebra community on uh, algorithms that fall within this matrix sketching model. And generally getting lower bounds for these algorithms can be done via reductions to one-way communication complexity. I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but basically you can use the fact that there's no adaptivity. So uh, you sketch your matrix once and then you extract information from that sketch and you, can't, you don't make adaptive queries. So it's easier to prove lower bounds in this model. So, the matrix vector query model is interesting to us because it captures many algorithms that are used in practice. In particular, it captures Krilov subspace methods and a lot of the sketching methods used in randomized numerical linear algebra, um, allowing arbitrary adaptivity of my queries. So like my second query might depend on my first and my third query might depend on both of them, makes the model a lot richer. For example, it lets it encompass Krilov subspace methods, but proving lower bounds in this model, meaning proving that you can't do any better than our current algorithms, um, it seems doable. It seems hard, but doable. So for us, it seems to be a sweet spot for sort of understanding uh, problem complexity, complexity in uh, numerical linear algebra. Um, of course, there are limitations. In particular, this model doesn't capture lots of methods studied in the community. Um, it doesn't capture things like stochastic gradient or coordinate descent for solving linear systems. 
It doesn't capture lots of sparse matrix methods, lots of preconditioning approaches, multi-grid methods, all sorts of methods, you name it, it doesn't capture it, but it does capture a lot of methods and that's why we're focusing on it. Okay, so that's just sort of an overview of the broader um, research agenda that this work fits into. So now a summary of um, our results. What we show is that um, we give an algorithm that with roughly one over epsilon matrix vector multiplications suffices to return with high probability a one plus or minus epsilon relative error to the trace of any positive semi-definite matrix A. And this is a quadratic improvement of Hutch over Hutchinson's method. So um, <clears throat> in Hutchinson's method, you require one over epsilon squared queries. We're requiring one over epsilon. So we're improving on this quadratically. And this is why we're calling our method Hutch plus plus. It's sort of like a improved version of Hutchinson's method. Um, the algorithm achieving this bound is super simple. Um, I'll show you code for it later in the talk. You can write it in five lines of MATLAB. Um, and it's simple enough that variants of it have been studied in the past in the literature. So we're not really completely int introducing a new algorithm. Um, probably the work study closest to ours that has basically done a variant of this algorithm is by Gambier, Stratopolis, and Organos. Um, and then there's also work by Lynn doing a very similar um, approach to what we're doing. So what we're really doing is sort of doing a slight variant on these approaches and giving an analysis, which shows that this one over epsilon um, query bound holds. Um, and this algorithm performs much better experimentally in lots of different applications as compared to Hutchinson's methods. So I'll show you those experiments at the end of the talk. Um, and then the other thing is that we complement this upper bound. So we complement this algorithm um, with a lower bound. We show that this algorithm is essentially optimal. You need at least one over epsilon matrix vector multiplies if you want to estimate the trace of a positive semi-definite matrix um, to epsilon accuracy. And we have two different approaches for proving this lower bound. One is via reduction to multi-round communication complexity. And one is via reduction to a statistical problem, which is hypothesis testing for negatively spiked covariance matrices. So I may get to talking about um, this first reduction today, but it's at the very end of my talk. I might not get to it, um, but you can check out the paper for this full reduction. These two different approaches have slightly different merits. So the reduction to communication complexity holds in a bounded bit precision model, but it loses a log factor. It basically loses a factor depending on your precision. Um, the other lower bound holds in the real RAM model of computation where you just pretend everything you're, you, you're working with is a real number and doing operations like multiplying two real numbers together takes order one cost. Um, so they apply in slightly different models, but uh, roughly they both show that you need one over epsilon matrix vector multiplies to get a good trace estimate. Okay, great. So those are our results. And now what I'm gonna do is just present you the intuition behind our method. So the intuition behind this Hutch plus plus method is just based on two very simple observations. The first observation is that in terms of approximating the trace, Hutchinson's method performs much better when my matrix has a slowly decaying spectrum. Um, so when my eigenvalues are falling off very slowly. And the reason for this is simple. Um, the actual error bound that Hutchinson's achieves is it achieves that the trace estimate T tilde minus the true trace of your matrix is bounded by epsilon times the Frobenius norm. And then I just said that for positive semi-definite matrices, we can upper bound this by epsilon by times the trace. And this gave us our approximation guarantee. Um, however, when the spectrum is flat, uh, meaning the eigenvalues are decaying uh, slowly, the Frobenius norm is way smaller than the trace. And so this was a really loose thing to do. And Hutchinson's is actually this epsilon times Frobenius norm error bound is actually way better than the epsilon times trace error bound that I converted it to. So in the extreme case, you can just think about this. This is basically just due to the comparison between the L2 norm of the eigenvalues, which is the Frobenius norm, and the L1 norm of the eigenvalues, with the, which is uh, the trace. Um, in the most extreme case, we have no decay. All of our eigenvalues are equal to each other. In this case, the Frobenius norm is the square root of the sum of eigenvalues squared, um, which if all the eigenvalues are equal to each other is exactly equal to one over square root of n times the sum of eigenvalues, or in other words, it's one over square root of n times the trace. So if my spectrum is perfectly flat, my error bound of Hutchinson's rather being, than being like epsilon times the trace is actually epsilon over square root of n times the trace. 
if n is large, which it is in many of these applications, I have a really tight error bound on approximating the trace. Okay, that's intuition one. Hutchinson's method performs well when my spectrum's flat. The second observation is sort of equally as simple, which is that when my spectrum is decaying, we can get a good approximation to the trace just by computing the top eigenvalues of my matrix. So the trace is the sum of eigenvalues. If my spectrum is decaying very quickly, or like if my matrix, for example, is numerically low rank, then this sum of eigenvalues is really well approximated mm -hmm. by just the sum of the top k eigenvalues, where k is some number much, much less than n. Um, in other words, my trace is very close to trace of a qq transpose, where qq transpose is just the projection matrix onto um, my top k eigenvectors. Or in other words, I can write this as trace, just using cyclicity of the trace. This is trace of q transpose aq, where the columns of q are my top q eigenvectors, I mean, k eigenvectors. So if I know my top k eigenvectors and my spectrum is decaying, then I can just get a good approximation to the trace. I don't need to use Hutchinson's method. I can just add up my top k eigenvalues. Um, or if I want to write that in terms of a trace, that's trace of q transpose aq, um, and I can get a good approximation. So there's sort of these competing paradigms, flat spectrum, Hutchinson's does really well, decaying spectrum, just computing the top eigenvalues and adding them up does really well. Um, as I mentioned, Q itself, so I, sorry, I didn't mention this, but I'll mention it now. Q itself can be computed with, if I'm computing the top K eigenvectors using a Krilov subspace method or just block power method or something, we can compute Q with roughly K matrix vector multiplication queries. Um, we can use an iterative method to compute those top k eigenvectors and values. Um, and trace of QQ transpose, which is trace of Q transpose AQ, can be computed with just k additional matrix vector multiplies. I'm just computing the quadratic form of my eigenvectors over my matrix. Um, now, this approach of just approximating the trace by the largest eigenvalues is quite common. So it's appeared a lot in the literature before. Again, I'm probably missing some papers, but um, Notable ones that, that look like this paper by Saibaba, Alexandrian, and Ibsen um, looks very closely at this method where they're basically projecting, they're using a randomized uh, method to approximate these top K eigenvalues. Um, and then they're just using the, that sum to approximate the trace. So there's lots of literature on this um, uh, that uses this idea. Okay, so the simple idea behind this paper is just that um, we want to combine these two paradigms. We want to combine when Hutchinson does it well with when does eigenvalue computation do, do well. And roughly what our observation is, is that every matrix has a spectrum that's either flat enough or decaying enough to get better than a one over epsilon squared bound for the query complexity of trace estimation. So actually to get a one over epsilon bound. Okay. Um, so this is this algorithm, Hutch++, and um, again, it's, it's basically a variant on this algorithm, uh, on some algorithms that have been done in the past, so I'm just sort of rewriting it here. Um, step one, we're going to find an approximate span for our top k eigenvectors, q. Um, step two, we're going to observe that my matrix trace, just by linearity of the trace, is equal to the trace of A projected onto those, that approximate span plus the trace of the residual, so A minus itself projected onto that span. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna approximate the trace of the residual, so A minus A projected onto the span of my top eigenvectors, using, using Hutchinson's method with L random query vectors. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna return the trace of A projected onto the span. This is just the sum of top K eigenvalues plus the trace estimate for the residual. So pictorially what we're doing is we're computing the eigenvalues in the head of the matrix and we're just adding them up explicitly. That's trace of AQQ transpose. We're gonna get very little error. I mean, we're gonna get zero error on that part because we can exactly compute uh, trace of AQQ transpose using just K matrix vector multiplication queries. All of our error is gonna come from basically approximating the trace that corresponds to the tail of the matrix. So the trace that corresponds to all those small eigenvalues of the matrix. So the only error is from our estimator of 
trace of A minus AQ2 transpose. And if the Frobenius norm of this matrix is very small compared to the Frobenius norm of A, which we expect it to be when the spectrum's decaying, then it's gonna have much lower variance um, uh, Dan Hutchinson's and we're going to get a much smaller error. Um, any questions before I move on to sort of how we analyze this? So there are currently no questions in Zoom or YouTube. Okay, one just came in. Uh, um, maybe you can keep going and we can, we can ask that one a little bit later. Sounds good to me. Okay. Um, Okay, so how are we gonna analyze this? We're just gonna use um, a very standard result by now in randomized numerical linear algebra, um, uh, which I think was first proved by Sarlish in 2006. Um, this is very related to these methods that Martinson was talking about here two weeks ago. Um, if I choose a random matrix um, with roughly K columns uh, and random plus minus one entries, and I let Q be an orthogonal basis for my matrix A times this random matrix S, um, then with very high probability, the Frobenius norm residual, A minus its projection onto the span, so A minus AQQ transpose, is gonna be less than two times the Frobenius norm of, and two is arbitrary here, it's gonna be close to this, but with very high probability, less than two times the Frobenius norm of A minus its best rank K approximation AK. So uh, A minus AK is the smallest uh, Frobenius norm difference between my matrix A and a rank K matrix. AK is just given by projecting A onto its top K eigenvectors. Um, so this is a standard result. I take my matrix, I multiply it by a random sketching matrix. I look at the span of that sketched matrix. And if I project onto it, my residual is less than two times A minus AK in the Frobenius norm. And Q can be viewed as running a single step of um, the block power method. So this work by Ibsen et al. basically does this in order to compute a Lorentz approximation. They sometimes run one step, sometimes they run two or three steps, um, depending on the circumstance. But in this case, I'm just gonna say, let's just run one step of the block power method and we'll have this guarantee with very high probability. Now, a basic fact which I won't prove here, but you can do it just by manipulating the, eigen, the sum of eigenvalues, is that for any positive semi-definite matrix, the difference between A and AK in the Frobenius norm, remember AK is the best rank K approximation of my matrix, is upper bounded by one over square root of K times the trace of my matrix. So this is for any matrix that doesn't assume anything about the spectral decay. Um, the Frobenius norm A minus AK is upper bounded by one over square root of K times the trace. So if I look, use the guarantee from the previous slide, what that means is that the Frobenius norm of A minus AQQ transpose, where Q is my like approximation to my top eigenspace, it's less than two times the optimal Frobenius norm error, meaning it's less than like two over square root of K times the trace, okay? So what this means is that if I look at my trace estimate, remember what I'm doing is that I have the spectrum of my matrix, I've projected the spectrum roughly onto the top eigenvectors, not exactly, but I've projected them onto some subspace Q. I'm exactly computing the trace projected onto that subspace. And then I'm applying stochastic trace estimation to the tail of the eigenvectors to the, the residual. So with high probability, the stochastic trace estimator for that tail, P tilde minus the true trace of A minus AQ transpose, just by standard Hutchinson's bound is bounded by one over square root of L times the Frobenius norm of A minus I times Q Q transpose, where L is the number of queries I actually use for that stochastic trace estimator. So combining these two bounds, the error in estimating the trace of the tail, which is all the error I get, is one over square root of L times two over square root of K times the trace. And if I set L and K both to roughly one over epsilon, then this gives me error, which is equal to epsilon times the trace. So overall, my total error in approximating the trace, which is exactly equal to my error in approximating the trace of A, the residual, is bounded by epsilon times trace of A. And I've used roughly one over epsilon queries in order to find this span Q. And I've used one over epsilon, I mean, one over epsilon queries in order to approximate the trace of the tail. 
So I've used one over epsilon queries overall. Okay, so let me just state that as a theorem. That's the whole, basically the whole analysis is very simple. Um, if I let L equal K and both be roughly one over epsilon and A is a positive semi-definite matrix, then with high probability, this Hutch plus plus method uses exactly two K plus L queries and it returns a trace estimate um, satisfying uh, T tilde is within one minus epsilon times trace of A and one plus epsilon times trace of A. So my total com query complexity is roughly one over epsilon. This is my quadratic improvement on Hutchinson's estimator, but I get the exact same bound in terms of how well I approximate the trace. Um, the code for this is pasted here. You can write it in, I guess, there's five substantive lines of MATLAB here. Um, it just requires computing this random sketch of your matrix, um, taking an orthogonal span for that sketch. This gives you Q. Uh, then computing the trace of Q transpose AQ plus a trace estimate on the residual. So this is the whole method here. It's super simple to implement. It's nearly as simple as Hutchinson's method itself. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention is that this method is adaptive, meaning that our choice of XI, the ith query, can depend on the choices of the previous queries. And this is because we first do this random projection step in order to sort of uh, deflate the top eigenvectors of the matrix. And then we perform Hutchinson's. So in that there's an adaptivity in the queries. But what we also show in the paper, and I'm not gonna talk about it all today, is that you can make this algorithm non-adaptive. So there's a variant on this algorithm that achieves the same bounds up to constant factors where none of the queries depend on each other. And this is advantageous, for example, if you want to make your queries in parallel. So this lets you make your queries all in parallel and then post-process them all together um, because the queries don't depend on each other. So we call that method NA Hutch++, non-adaptive Hutch++. I won't go into it here, but in the experiments, you'll see that plotted. Okay, that's the main theoretical result. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about experimental results and if I have time, I'll talk about the lower bound, which shows that this result is optimal. So um, the first set of experimental results, just to sort of get a sense for what's going on, we generated a synthetic matrix A uh, with a spectrum that is just decaying as a power law. Um, and then we tweaked how, how fast the spectrum was decaying and then compared um, four different methods. So we compared um, Hutchinson's method we compared this subspace project method, which is basically the method of Ipsen et al. This is the method that just approximates the top K eigenvalues and adds them up to approximate the trace. We also compared Hutch++, our main method, and then we compared this non-adaptive variant NA Hutch++. So in the first case, I have a matrix uh, where this, this C is set to two. So you can think about this as I have a power law decay quadratically, I have a fairly quickly decaying spectrum. In this case, Hutchinson's is the black line, it performs worse because Hutchinson's doesn't do that well when I have a quickly decaying spectrum. It's significantly outperformed by the subspace projection method because um, as I, because since my spectrum is decaying quickly, taking the sum of top eigenvalues is a totally reasonable thing to do to approximate the trace. But that method is significantly outperformed further by Hutch++ and um, Hutch++ and A. And this is because the tail of the matrix, the residual, still does have some important contribution to the trace. So we're able to get much faster um, convergence to small error than both, both baselines, the Hutchinson's method and the subspace projection method. Um, I'll note, by the way, that here on the bottom, just, to, just because I didn't mention it, the x-axis is number of matrix vector multiplication queries. So these different methods use their matrix vector multiplication mm -hmm. queries in different ways. So what we did was we just normalized. So like uh, in our case, if the number of matrix vector multiplications is M, we have to set our parameters so that they all of our matrix vector multiplications queries add up to M. And we did that for all methods to make it a fair comparison. Um, now, as my spectrum um, starts decaying slower, we can see that Hutchinson starts doing a little bit better than subspace project, but we still see really good performance of Hutch++. Um, as we slow down the decay of the spectrum more, we eventually see that Hutchinson's and Hutch++ are converging. And this is because Hutchinson's just does really well when your spectrum is flat. But the takeaway from these images for us were that we're not doing that much worse than Hutchinson's ever. So even though we're doing way better when our spectrum decays quickly, when the spectrum is flat, 
all three of these methods are comparable. Um, note that in these cases, the subspace project method is doing very poorly, but that's because it's not designed to work in this setting. It's designed to work when you have fast spectral decay or numerically lower rank matrices. And so it's doing very poorly in this setting that it's not designed to work. Okay, so those are synthetic examples. Um, another application we looked at was approximating the trace of the matrix exponential, um, where the matrix exponential is uh, applied to a graph adjacency matrix. This trace, when I apply it to an adjacency matrix is known as um, the Estrada index or the natural connectivity of the network. Um, the matrix exponential tends to make big eigenvalues bigger and small eigenvalues smaller. So it's kind of like a good case for our method. Um, and you can see here that indeed Hutch plus plus is significantly outperforming Hutchinson's, which is the baseline and the subspace projection method. Um, eventually, if you went out to high enough rank, subspace projection method might outperform us because eventually the matrix will be numerically low rank and subspace projection method will get the trace exactly. Um, but before that, we're, 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 we're outperforming both these baselines. A second example, which is less of a good example for us is in approximating the log determinant of a matrix. So here we were doing a paper on Gaussian process regression. And as part of that, we had to approximate the log determinant of B, which is a kernel covariance matrix plus lambda I, where lambda I is a regularization term. Um, and so we just tested using Hutch plus plus to approximate this log determinant, which is trace of the log of the matrix. And you can see that in this case, we're kind of performing comparably to Hutchinson's. We're performing a little bit worse, which makes sense because we're kind of wasting matrix vector queries on deflating the top subspace, even though it, it's not really there. And both methods are performing well, much better than the subspace projection method. Um, the takeaway from this is that matrix function that actually flatten the spectrum. So the log flattens the spectrum. It squashes your large eigenvalues compared to your small eigenvalues. In this case, Hutchinson's tends to do really well, but what we're, we're happy to see is that um, we're not performing much worse. So in this case, Hutchinson's does much better than the worst case one over epsilon squared bound predicts. It's performing more around this one over epsilon bound and we're performing comparably. Okay, and then the final, I think the final one I'm gonna show you is just that this Hutch plus plus method seems to work empirically well for non-positive semi-definite matrices. So our theory specifically applies to positive semi-definite matrices, but there's no reason you can't apply it to non-PSD matrices. In this case, we looked at a common application in network analysis, which is triangle counting. So we let uh, B be the adjacency matrix of uh, two different uh, networks, a, a citation network and a, vote, a Wikipedia voting network. Um, and trace of B cubed over six is the number of triangles in these networks. If we look at how we're doing on approximating the trace, Hutch plus plus is sort of performing the best. Um, Hutchinson's is sort of roughly performing the worst. And the subspace projection method is sometimes performing better than us and then sometimes performing worse. I think this is a little bit due, this method really isn't designed to naively be used for non-PSD matrices because it basically takes the top K magnitude eigenvalues and depending on how the sign flips of the eigenvalues are ordered, you can get sort of weird behavior. So I'm guessing there are variants of this that would do better than what I'm showing here, but just the basic method is sort of less consistently performing than us. And you can see that we're converging at a much faster rate than Hutchinson's. Um, okay, that's triangle estimation. Um, and let me just say intuitively, why should we be doing well in non-PSD matrices? Um, for a non-PSD matrix, our projection step uh, basically removes the largest magnitude eigenvalues. And this tends to still significantly decrease the Frobenius norm um, and to significantly reduce the variance. In the very worst case, it might not do that. Um, but uh, in these natural settings, like if we don't have some worst case matrix, um, it significantly reduces the variance of Hutchinson's, so our method seems to still converge much faster than Hutchinson's. Um, all right, so that's actually it for the applications. Let's see, we have 15 minutes. The remainder of my slides are on the lower bounds. So what I'm gonna do is why don't I stop, I'm gonna skip my lower bound slides, present you with open work, take questions, and if we have some extra time, I can talk about lower bounds at the end. So let me just go to the, to the um, open questions or future work. So um, uh, we show 
in the part of the talk that I didn't present that our method is optimal up to constants, meaning that you can't beat this. If you want this guarantee for trace estimation, you can't have more than, you can't improve on the query complexity by more than constants. One thing we're interested in is extending this lower bound to show that uh, if you want to compute, say, trace of a matrix cubed or trace of the exponential or trace of the inverse, that combining Hutch++ with iterative matrix methods is also optimal in the matrix vector query model. And we have some results, for example, with trace of A cubed, um, but we'd like to extend those. Another thing we'd like to do, but this is much harder, is we would like to give at least conditional lower bounds for simple problems like triangle counting, meaning like trace of A cubed, in a more general computational model. So in general, we don't have a lot of computational lower bounds in linear algebra when we're allowed to access our matrix in an arbitrary way. Um, and giving lower bounds on like say computing trace of A cubed, there's been some work in theoretical computer science on connecting these problems to improving the speed of fast matrix multiplication. Um, but the work is limited. It mostly looks at combinatorial problems like triangle counting. Um, and we'd like to extend that to other problems in numerical linear algebra. Um, We'd like to combine these randomized trace estimation techniques with randomized approximate matrix vector multiplication. So can I speed up my matrix vector multiplies by entry-wise sampling the matrix or sparsifying it in some way um, and then get even faster methods for trace estimation? Um, and then another thing is we just like would like to try out more practical use cases and implementations of Hutch++. It's a super simple algorithm. It can easily be used as a drop-in for Hutchinson's estimator. There's been some recent work uh, after we published earlier this year, using it in uh, applying it to quantum typicality methods and estimating the trace of Hessians in certain optimization problems. So that's just one thing is I'd like to see like, can it be used to actually give practical gains um, over Hutchinson's in different applications? Um, okay, so that sort of wraps it up and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank, thank you, Cameron. So we have uh, plenty of questions on Zoom. So I will just unmute people in the order that they ask them. So uh, Rick Haff, would you like to ask your question? I yeah, um, hey Cameron. So um, you mentioned the problem with removing the PSD condition is that the signs of the like values might change. Um, if instead of estimating the trace, you wanted to estimate say the Shatten one norm, um, mm -hmm. would you be, then be able to remove the PSD condition? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So say you want to estimate the shot in one norm of a matrix. Uh, the only way I know how to do that is you basically apply, you basically apply a matrix function, which tries to turn all the eigenvalues positive. And then once you do that, you do uh, trace estimation. So I actually have some work doing this. Other people have some work doing this. So you could uh, basically apply these methods where you drop in Hutch plus plus at, uh, as a um, replacement for um, the trace estimation part as compared to Hutchinson's. But my understanding is the hard part of that problem, like estimating the Shannon one norm of the matrix is really applying this function, which lets you sort of flip the signs of the negative eigenvalues. That's really the challenging part. And then trace estimation is sort of an afterthought, but that's the type of problem we would like to prove lower bounds for. We'd like to show that like uh, estimating Shannon one norm can be solved optimally using this Hutch plus plus method would be really challenging, but interesting lower bound for us. Thanks. You also have a question from Mos Hafa. Mos Hafa, are you yes. there? Yes. Hello. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I want to ask about the. Uh, please go, go to the side of uh, of the code. The slide of the code. Oh, the code. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Here we go. Yeah. Thanks. Here, um, I want to ask about the, the benefit of, uh, of computing the, the G uh, matrix. Because I, oh, I right. think it's uh, almost the same of the of S and uh, yeah. we, can, we can use it uh, here in the code, I mean, to compute right. the T. And then- Yeah, that's uh, a great question. Um, I should have mentioned this actually. So we compute two different random sketching matrices, which are, as you're pointing out, identically distributed to each other. So we use S in order to compute the uh, this span Q, we use it to compute this near optimal lower rank approximation. And then what G is, is it's the, it's the sketch, the vectors used to actually implement Hutchinson's. And for our theory to work, um, S and G have to be independent matrices because otherwise there could be weird correlations and you can't just separately apply these two bounds that we've applied, which say that we project off the top eigenvectors and we do trace estimation. In practice, I'm not so sure. We, um, 
uh, we did run where these matrices were the same um, and we didn't see much difference in performance. So that's like an interesting question. Um, again, it doesn't affect the number of matrix vector multiplications you do. It just prevents you from generating this second random matrix, but it's definitely like a possibly useful variant on our method. But the theory would be much harder to understand the theory, I think, because you have these weird correlations between the two procedures. Okay, uh, uh, second question, please. Uh, you know, uh, there is m, uh, m divided by three. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, which function shall I use? Uh, I mean, a stencil function or uh, or floor function? Because here uh, m over three, maybe uh, it would be uh, a fraction. Yeah. Fraction so, number. Yeah. This is. Oh yeah. So this code I simplified just to make it easier to read. You could just like ceiling that or floor that. So but it doesn't I, but I will mention something, which is basically the reason I am here is I'm passing in the number of queries that I want to use. And then the reason I make these matrices of M over three queries is that that means in the end, I'll actually use M matrix vector multiplication queries exactly. I could have distributed those queries in different ways. So if I thought my spectrum was decaying fast, I might've wanted to use more queries for the part that deflates the spectrum. If I thought my spectrum is decaying slow, I might've wanted to use more queries for the part that does Hutchinson's. So in general, setting those constants is something that you might try to tune. For us, we didn't get much gain in performance by tuning them. So we just default set the number of queries for each of those random matrices to be exactly M over three, where M is the number of queries I pass in. Does that okay. make sense? Uh, I think so. That does make sense to me. Um, okay. We'll move on to uh, Cleve Mola. So Cleve, you are, can unmute yourself. Okay, am I there now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, beautiful talk. Just pitch, yeah. pitch, pitched it someone, someone like me, just the right level for me. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, just on the last, just on the last thing, while you still got this slide up, the time spent in lines two and three is mm -hmm. much smaller than the lines time spent in the later lines, right? Yeah, so it that's right. So, so, the yeah. so the cost of computing, you might as well compute G2 as well. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's right. Like that's why we didn't, I guess, look into it a ton is that those, if the number of queries is small, those lines are very cheap compared to actually performing the matrix vector multiplications. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Um, second thing is uh, you assume a PSD. So your constants must involve some measure of nearness to uh, not PSD. Um, they actually don't. Our constants are just like universal constants. Like uh, I can't pull them off the top of my head, but literally like, you know, 20 or something like this. Like they're not depending on any well, feature of the matrix. The reason if your matrix is this bound, uh, how far back is it? Oh, good. It's right here. This bound that I, all we need, the only thing that we use about PSD-ness is this bound right here. Well, and the fact that trace estimation gives relative error for a PSD matrix, but we just use the fact that if I deflate the eigenvalues, um, the Frobenius norm of my deflated matrix is upper bounded by one over square root of K times the trace. And even if my matrix is very close to not PSD, like even has lots of very, very small eigenvalues, this bound still holds. If my matrix is not PSD, but doesn't have really large negative eigenvalues, this bound will also still hold. Um, so this might be an explanation of why like it works reasonably well, even when it's not PSD sometimes. Yeah, I, I, I don't see it where it would be, but I, there must be some measure, there must be some measure of your hypothesis uh, in, the, in the constants. Uh, last thing. Uh, I love your MATLAB blocks with the gray scale and the blue scale around it. Things that's really nice. Oh, thank you. I, did, I can't claim. I, I I did not make the plots. Uh, Chris Musco made the plots, so um, <laughs> all credit goes to him. Oh, yeah. okay. I like them too, though. Thank you. Really? Okay. Oh, yeah. Those are very nice. Thanks, Chris. Is Chris here? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, maybe I don't know actually. I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we have a question from Andreas, so you can unmute yourself. Hi, Cameron, great talk. Hey. Um, can you go back to slide 22? Yeah, I'm trying to get, oh, 22, I see. Yeah. So I, 
So I fully get the fact that uh, with slow decay, Hutchinson is better. You, you can see it is so much slower. The black line is lower now, but I, I, I ball it. And mm -hmm. the slope is still one over epsilon squared. Oh, um, yeah, this is a good, a really good question. So it's a little, we plotted these as log plots, which is, uh, okay, actually, let me think before answering this question, because I've thought about this before and I, it's a little tricky. Um, so the slope, okay, I'm going to tell you an answer and there's a slight chance I'm wrong. And if not, if, if I am, I'll just email you later to correct it. Okay. I believe in this case, when the spectrum's flat, the slope should still be kind of like converging like one over epsilon squared. But the point is that it has a huge factor. It's, it has a huge fat, like say the, say my, my spectrum is flat, right? So um, in that case, uh, uh, the Frobenius norm of the matrix is bounded by, let's say one over square root of n times the trace. So the Frobenius norm is much, much less than the trace, right? What the error of Hutchinson's is, is the error will be basically, uh, if I take one over epsilon squared queries, I get an uh, error, which is epsilon over square root of n times the trace. So the convergence with epsilon is still going as one over epsilon squared. It's just that you're really helped out by this constant, which is a function of your matrix, which is how does the Frobenius norm compare to the, um, compare to the trace? Does that sort of make sense? So the convergence rate is the same, um, but the actual like, values are much smaller. And when you look at when the spectrum is decaying, we actually get better convergence rate because by doing the deflation, we actually get like better scaling with epsilon. That's right. Yeah. And that's right. So, so that's right. You're getting a, a, a continuously different constant as you update it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's um, a little bit confusing because say you cranked epsilon really small, the slope of these lines would change kind of because like um, eventually we would start doing the deflation. You'd be something you actually want to do. Um, but in this range where epsilon is not like ridiculously small, they look like flat lines. So let me make one additional comment. So this is very similar to what we had observed in our paper. Uh, right. The very cool additional thing that you guys did is the fact that uh, because this is a Frobenius norm approximation, that's what you need to do. Frobenius norm, uh, according to the randomized literature of the last decade, does not depend on angles, right? So you don't really need a singular value solver to get this very fast. And right. Therefore, you can get your constant going down as one over square root of k. Right. And you can get these results. So um, this is cool. Right. Yeah. I mean, actually, like I view our paper as like a very simple addendum onto what you guys did, which is basically step one: just use this very coarse uh, projection method. Step two: just analyze it for PSD matrices in a very simple way, and uh, that's pretty much it. But other than that, it's pretty much exactly your the method that you guys have used and that other people have used in the past. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so we have one more question left, but that's from Daniel Kresner. So I'll pass over to Daniel. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks, Cameron, for the very nice talk. Uh, when you were talking thanks. about the trace of the exponential of uh, B, wouldn't it make sense to define a complexity model in terms of matrix vector multiplies with B instead of A? Um, yeah, that, are you talking about for like the plot for these error, for these experimental plots? Yeah, so, so yeah. You, you were defining your complexity model uh, with matrix vector multiplies with A, but this may be very expensive right. and you cannot execute it exactly. Yeah, I think it depends on the setting a little bit. One nice thing about defining it with respect to A is it sort of lets you abstract away whatever algorithm you're using to approximate the matrix exponential. So it sort of lets you compare these trace estimations just based on them, the, the, the trace estimation part itself and ignore how did you actually compute the matrix exponential because you might have many ways of doing that. But I agree, like one thing we're interested in is, is improving optimality, is proving optimality guarantees for like approximating let's say trace of the exponential. And in that case, we would count the number of um, iterations used to approximate the exponential. Just for clarity, I forgot to mention, but like in the experiments, this function was approximated with the Lanchos method. We use the same number of iterations within Lanchos for all the different trace estimation methods. So we use like 10 iterations of Lanchos. So you can think about, you would basically scale up this x-axis by 10 for exactly for all of these methods. Does that, does that answer it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. Thank you.
Okay, thanks again, Cameron, for the very nice talk. I will now share my screen with uh, the announcements of the next talks. So let's see. I can do that. Okay, I think this should be okay. Okay, so there are three more talks to go before we enter the conference season and the summer. So uh, in two weeks, there will be in two or three weeks by Nikhil Skrivastava. Then Serkan Gugercin, and then the this season will be concluded on May 5th by Madeleine Udet from Cornell.